Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Sideview Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to introduce you all to Johannes Niederhauser. Johannes uh, completed his PhD in 2018 at Warwick University, where he wrote on Heidegger on the question of death and being. And more recently, this year, he published a book on the same topic with Springer University or Springer Press. Um, and he's also the founder of the Halkion Thinkers Guild. So please welcome Johannes. Thank you very much, Adam, for having me. Yeah, Lovely introduction. Great, great to have you on here. Um, you know, I, I first, I believe the first I heard of you and your work was um, you had given a, a lecture on Heidegger and technology. I believe this was for the course you did with Justin Murphy, I think, but you had done a kind of a like a public intro lecture sort of on the question of Heidegger and technology. And um, at the time I had been, I had just had it in my headphones, you know, I didn't have any context for who you were as a person. It's just kind of this, uh, you know, disembodied floating voice talking about Heidegger. Um, yeah. And I thought, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly not uh, a Heidegger scholar by any means. I know a little bit about Heidegger. Um, but I came away, I felt like I came away from that lecture. Like I really understood some things, um, that I hadn't before. And I thought your, you, your delivery of the ideas was, was, was quite mature and fairly high level. I think when you're giving it an intro like that, it's actually harder to kind of make it accessible, um, than it is to kind of go in and just assume that everybody knows the same jargon and has the same background as you do. And so I thought, wow, this is this is this is a really impressive guy. And then I discovered um, that you're quite young, and certainly by academic and scholarship standards, very early on in your work. You know, finishing your PhD in in 2018. Um, and so yeah. then I was I was kind of even more impressed that you were you were kind of there already in your in your thinking. Um, so I looked into what you were doing, and you know what's going on with this guy. Um, and I found out that you were also quite uh, active online, which I think is something that we're seeing increasingly these days. Uh, scholars, academics looking for new venues, uh, new media, mm -hmm. new ways yeah. of creating uh, community and interaction. So I wanted to start there. And so I want to ask you about um, Halkion Thinkers Guild. Uh, you're the mm -hmm. founder of Halkion. So can you tell us a little bit about what, what is Halkion and what inspired you to start it? It's a good question. I'll try, I have to start at the beginning of this where I have the, where I found the name for it. The Halkion bird or Halcyon, I think you'd rather say in, in English, is um, the ancient Greek or mythological name for the kingfisher. The ice bird. It's the bird that breeds once a year during winter solstice when the sea is flat and calm. But already, of course, uh, the bird knows that the sea will, the tempest will return, cold and terrible weather will return also. But he retains that bird uh, is capable of maintaining a certain calmness. Nietzsche quite often speaks of the halcyonics of, for example, in Beyond Good and Evil, that which is really noble in a work or human being is the moment when their sea is smooth and they have found halcyon self-sufficiency. It sounds a bit strange in English. Uh, the German is uh, halkionische Selbstgenügsamkeit, so maybe halcyonic self-sufficiency. Um, he also says that uh, halcyonians are devoted to light feet, wit, fire, grave, grand logic, stellar dancing, the vibrating light of the South, the calm sea perfection. There's something about Halkion that spoke to me about 10, 11 years ago when I had um, the really a time of quite intense reading of Nietzsche. And ever since then, the name's been with me. I wanted to start a journal uh, that never got anywhere. Uh, it was just a, a mere um, fixture of the brain, um, of the mind. I had always wanted to for some reason though always wanted also wanted to do videos this came up about five six years ago 
never got around to doing this also because I was so involved with the academic um, early, I wouldn't want to say career path, but there's a lot of energy that has to go into being focused on getting a good MA and then getting a scholarship and um, also early publications, etc. But then when I finished in 2018 and had seen what's possible within academia and what isn't possible, I thought that perhaps what I need to do, I need to find some sort of a, a way out. Um, because I couldn't see myself butchering, for example, my, my thesis into papers mm -hmm. just to get enough papers published. As you know, Publisher Parish is one of the... Um, one of the slogans, I wanted to publish it as a book. So play, playing the academic game didn't really seem very appealing. Um, in fact, I have an economics background when you think about it in terms of just pure uh, a business perspective. On the free market, there are more opportunities. There are almost none in academia. There's certain, so there's certainly more in the US than there is um, in Europe. There's certainly almost none for continental philosophy in the UK. So it was very clear that there are much more people with PhDs, many more people in PhDs than there would be physicians. So I had to kind of find a way, and this is a, you know, telling the story now sounds like I had some sort of an idea. I didn't. I simply saw the possibility of maybe putting out videos and see whatever happens with those, but in, in lecture style, lectures that I would have liked maybe to to give but wouldn't have been able within the confines of academia um and so kind of just kept growing from there and Halkion, as i said has been with me for 10 11 years that that name and in early 2020 it kind of i i became a bit more active on twitter and saw a lot of things like for example you know, your project the side view and some other people that were active in, in sort of an independent uh, space, Justin Murphy, certainly also one of them, and thought, well, maybe it's time to come back to this old idea for a name for something and combine it with something else I had seen somewhere, someone mentioning um, the re-emergence of guilds. And I just researched a bit what, what were the guilds, guilds were what universities actually first originated out of. Um, there were guilds of scholars that supported each other. And that was my idea then for, for Halkion, to be, to remain calm in a difficult time. And now we have that difficult time, but also to remain um, so focused, calmly focused on what is essential and what matters, which to me is being able to read and write philosophy and teach philosophy without any confines that um, are bureaucratic or technocratic. So I'd rather be challenged by the market forces than by some other invisible forces. I think that's one of the things in the background here. So the Thinkers Guild kind of emerged out of some inspiration that I had from other people in the space, it's one of these things where it's just you synthesize, you you know, you bring everything together all at once. All of a sudden, it makes sense. Built the website within a week, and then just asked a couple of people that I knew if they wanted to be involved somehow, whatever that's you know meant. Which just and now it's been kind of growing into something that I I'd, I'd like to see um, where I'd like to see it going. But in the beginning, it was very open, and I think it still is. But yeah. Yeah, that's great. And you're still, you're still teaching. Do you teach part time in kind of a traditional setting, or? Yeah, I teach. I teach seminars at Birkbeck College okay. in London. Yeah. Yeah. So there's still that you kind of foot in both worlds a little bit. A little bit, but um, it's. So I've done this for, for two or three years now, and. It's it's okay. I, there's a bit of a history there because I, I know some of the uh, professors. I have known them for a very long time, and they've been quite supportive. So um, 
it feels it feels natural to be in both worlds but i'm not applying for any positions i'm not uh, optimizing as they say for sure. for anything in the sure. academic uh, career i'm focusing most of my time on on building up the Halcyon academy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well let's talk about that then because this is a question that i think about a lot there's obviously huge advantages and huge new opportunities that come from uh, the digital space, the online space. Um, yep. It affords easy access to conversations like this. Certainly you can just start a blog and put your essays up there if you want to. You can circulate all kinds of content in that way. For, so from a, a sort of a, a production and dissemination standpoint, it's obviously a huge gift in a lot of ways. If you are one of these people who hasn't optimized for a traditional career path, or, you know, you just didn't have the privilege of just kind of landing in one of those lucky places that kind of gives you access to that whole kingdom of things. Um, it's a real, it, it's a real gift to have. At the same time, I think basically everybody agrees that we're also looking at kind of a lot of overproduction. There's a lot of stuff that just is kind of made and circulated and it's made very quickly. Um, people comment on it very quickly. Um, there's a downside there, right? And yeah. you can also see that there's a problem with the way gatekeeping functions in academia. But at least in my opinion, you can look online and, and probably agree that there's some function to be played for gatekeeping and for having a kind of hierarchy of uh, yeah. standards yeah. and abilities. And, um, you know, yourself, you have a PhD. I think that means something. I think that's going to continue to mean something. So yeah, how do you, course, how yeah. do you think about that? Um, there's a tension there, right? There's a tension between all of these new possibilities. And then there's also like kind of risks and, a whole other set of problems that that we need to think about and i think these these conversations for me are one a good way to let other people know about other you know what people are doing good thinkers yeah. good ideas but also a way like maybe we can kind of sort of troubleshoot in real time and in front of people who might participate later like what can we do here can we can we evolve the system you know and i think what you're doing with halkion is maybe one of those ways where you know you note that on the website that we need new institutions to face what's kind of coming at us from the future. Um, and so that, that question of institution building is also here in the background. There's a lot there, but yeah. what do you, what do you think about that general kind of the, the interface of your kind of, you know, your sort of traditional and rigorous background versus this, the kind of the wild west of the internet. <laughs> yeah, it is a wild west. Um, so Maybe just start from personal perspective. If I were to turn into a content creator, I would have forfeit my fate. I would. It's it. That's not that. That cannot be the focus, right? To be a content creator, that would mean to to make radio, uh, or to produce for the sake of production. And you can do this, right? You can sit down and just go through the key concepts of every single philosophical work, and you've produced content. So. <laughs> That might have some standards or not. And of course, the question of, of, of gatekeeping or standards is also important. Um, so I have a PhD. It's, it was a very intense uh, study of the phenomenon of death in Heidegger that goes through and covers about 40 or 30 or 40 years of, of writing. Um, it was based on this. I now published a book with, as you mentioned, Springer. So that's gone through the through the hands of the editors and reviewers, et cetera. And there's a certain standard to be upheld. I think though, to, and I hope this is not too simple, but a meeting between the two worlds can, so you hold yourself to the highest standards, first of all, you're, you know, you have to be honest in your scholarship. That means you don't make up quotes. Uh, you don't steal from anyone else. If it's original, then it has to be original if it's claimed as such. I taught a course on, on Nietzsche last year. I wrote a book on Nietzsche for this course. So my, my, um, my claim to myself um, 
is to, to really deliver only the best that I can deliver of the highest standards. But I also see the limitation, for example, with a standard career, at least what it looks like or would look like. I, I'm in the UK, I have a PhD from the UK. Um, I've had fundings from all kinds of different bodies, so I know how to get funding. Um, but if you know a little bit about how to get scholarships, I mean, I'm not going to go into that too far, but it follows certain trends. Uh, and you have to follow those trends, especially as a young researcher, to be able to get a scholarship. So even though maybe the threshold is very high to get one of them, you also have to be able to be, let's just say, flexible on what it is that you're officially doing in order to get the scholarship, right? So you, you've got all these problems everywhere. Um, you mean like bringing philosophical the two... trends? You mean like what's yeah. kind of yeah. current yeah. or hip in scholarship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All, so in Europe, it was realism for the past decade. Sure. New realism, speculative realism, etc. That was the new thought. This is now fading out, of course. Uh, no one remembers it. Uh, but uh, sorry, <laughs> if there's anyone who was who was uh, uh, invested in that, but I think um, to but for, so for example, to be able to to write a book on Nietzsche and teach it at the same time, which is when I mean, you think back to, to, on the topic of Heidegger, Heidegger wrote some of his best published books are lecture courses. That he gave to students, and some of them, some some of the some of the best writings from him are from the 1920s, from his time in Marburg. The gentleman who brought him to Marburg is Paul Nator, one of the Neo Kantians. When you read the Philosophische Systematik, philosophical systematicity, it's incredible. It's a lecture course. Mm -hmm. Fichte's Wissenschaftslehre uh, is also was also a lecture course, rewritten every single year. And today, even established scholars have to teach, and I'm purely telling you what's, what it's like in the UK, have to teach using PowerPoint. They have to teach the same course every single year. They have to not try and understand Plato again so that there's something enlivened about or in Plato's thinking. No, what's, what's this guy saying about Plato? What's this made up uh, term that someone invented to find some middle quasi way in Plato that then explains it to our current sentiments, etc. So it would be impossible, especially as a young career um, academic, to just sit down and say, well, I'm writing a book on Nietzsche. I'm officially a Heidegger expert. Um, so I wouldn't probably be allowed. But even if I were to allowed to teach Nietzsche without any official publications on him, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be free in doing so. So I think it, you know, and this is of course a difficult part, but one has to bring together the best if you like to speak with Leibniz, the best of all worlds into one, the highest standards, rigor, and you, you have to be able to, you know, in that sense, and really work hard and, and do exactly as you would for uh, an academic course, but then also may see that freedom that's possible there on the other side, where there's no one there to tell you, well, you can't teach this now because you're too young or you're not an expert, you don't have the publications or you need to use PowerPoint, et cetera. And I do something quite old school is I, I write a lecture. I'm going to teach a course on German idealism next. It's gonna be a couple of lectures on Kant. I'll write those and read those live with students asking questions after the course. And then we have a discussion seminar on the weekends for a couple of hours. We go over the material and my lectures are, as it were, gateways to understanding some of the most important parts of the first critique. It's quite, you know, it's actually what's always been done, but it's just now no longer actually uh, the ways of, of academia, where you have to teach the same course every single year, it has to do it in, in the UK with evaluations of universities and rankings. So there are some issues that I've seen just over the years where I still thought if I can maintain that kind of rigor and standard, but also see the freedom over here. And if it works out, then I'll try and yeah. build something. This is what this is what I'm increasingly interested in is how do yeah. you um, in institutional 
multi-generational kind of institutional training and yeah. production is something that I feel is sort of the next the next tier that online and the internet needs to somehow uh, we need we need to ascend to that level of things, which is yes. what universities in their healthy sense um, will produce. You'll have you'll have a you know generations of scholars, you know people who work under a professor and then kind of let out into the world to create um, and to teach others. When I look at the internet, I think that I see. I see what you're saying. I see. I see the freedom there. I see the there's creativity. There's less. There's less restriction. Um, the work feels more applicable, kind of to to the now, to the moment, because people are kind of free to just kind of follow inspiration, but also to move move quickly with the times as the times move. But I I continually find that the people who I find most interesting come from traditional backgrounds. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. In some sense, we are dependent on that system still, even as you've laid yeah. out, yeah. laid out accurately and convincingly, I think, in ways that uh, American listeners will agree with that there is a the bureaucracy of higher education um, has kind of uh, infested pedagogy with all these requirements that are more about making evaluation legible to the institution than it is about sort of forming and shaping students in a sort of traditional philosophical way. Um, and yet, yep. for all its faults, we're still better off with it than without it, I think. You know, we can't, yep. we can't get rid of those institutions. We have to work with them. Uh, yes. What's happening online isn't sufficient um, no. yet, but it could be. Like yep, you're saying, what you're saying is, is quite right, is that the, you know, the, the traditional methods are long lasting for a reason. You know, they have thousand, two thousand year old, even yeah. longer, yeah. two, three thousand year old, you know, history, depending on how you want to set your goalposts, those need to stay. Um, and so in some sense, I'm just thinking out loud, it seems like those, that traditional way of, of, of lecturing and, and transmitting information uh, is kind of being attacked both in the kind of uh, yeah. insanity of the internet and, you know, turning everything into content that you produce or whatever. And in the university, in these kind of bureaucratic systems, to say nothing of the the dire economic situation that uh, many of us face, yes. going into debt and so on, and then having way too many PhDs than there are jobs. The silver lining there, though, I think, is that what I've discovered is that the interest in philosophical ideas and philosophical content in 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 history in 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 deep readings of history is far bigger than what you would guess from the number of people who go into graduate school, right? So there seems mm -hmm. to be like a genuine thirst uh, yes. and a hunger for this kind of thing from people who weren't going to go to graduate school. They weren't going to get uh, a master's degree or a doctorate. Uh, and yet it's, it's, uh, it's clear that the culture at large hasn't delivered uh, these sources of wisdom and insight. And so now they're kind of coming back in these other ways, and and online is is yeah. is making that possible. But I'm wondering, like, in, just in terms of Halkion, and I know you 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 do courses and private tutorials there. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a sense that we could get to a place where people could go through sort of the Halkion experience and come out on the other side and become their own kind of sort of tutors and scholars and and writers? That's the aspiration. So that was on point. My ideal would be not to turn, as I say on the website, we do not worry here about worthless pieces of paper. Uh, and I quote yeah. Schelling, Schelling's lectures on university studies, mm -hmm. where he says, all of learning is summed up in this one rule. Learn only in order to create. My ideal or my what I aspire to is that years from now, it will simply be, oh, this person has studied at Halkion, and this will be good enough of a certificate. It doesn't require a piece of paper. And that there is a curriculum in place that can deliver this, which means teaches the classics, that includes also the languages, Latin and Greek, 
uh, at least the basics of it. I do this actually currently with my early Greek course. So we're going over the some, some not the grammar, but some of the foundational words of ancient or early Greek philosophy, like logos, physis, uh, stocheia, etc. Um, and that there is some sort of a curriculum in place then, which speaks to the classische Bildungsideal, the classical formation ideal of, or usually it's translated as education ideal, by Wilhelm von Humboldt, where um, you, you come out of it. And there's a very good book by Arthur Cronman, by the way, on this, Education's End. He's, he's a bit critical of Humboldt, which I don't fully understand why. But um, apart from that, some of the things that he says that are quite good, which is that your general formation education what you can quote and what you make your own, what you appropriate, right? If you can quote Homer in, a, in context and understand it profoundly, that becomes your character. That becomes who you are also to some degree. So that, that's the aspiration indeed, that there can be a, a curriculum at the end where people go out. So I'm, I'm current, this is why I'm currently building towards courses that offer this. So the early Greek course is focusing on what usually is referred to as the pre-Socratics, foundational philosophy, what are the presuppositions that come into play. German idealism with, will expand that. Maybe just to also briefly, just to say this even clearer, the, the irony is perhaps that I'm doing something very traditional, that even just in the sense that I write and I read a lecture, that's what lecture means, right? To read what you've written. Um, and to be in touch with your students who come for the sake of learning and not for the sake of getting a credential. The difference between very often, so even so, I, I admire students who study philosophy at university, especially here, it's 9,000 pounds per year. So there's something that that pulls them in. But very often what I see is that they come because they have, they want to be thrown into the wildest theories. And what they get is an extremely sterilized version of everything. This isn't against, this isn't, and nothing comes alive. And after a couple of years, usually they, most of them have lost either all hope or passion, or they start to play the academic game, right? Because they've, they've been, bitten by the back of all. I can play this power game. So you see second year, third year bachelor students who start talking like uh, young academics. Oh, I'm gonna publish here and I just do this and play it like that. And then I'm gonna get my MA here. <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> so I'm, and, but I, I admire students who do it, but I also see a difference between my, the students in the private courses and the students at, for example, Bergberg or Warwick, which is not one of, of uh, niveau, of their level of understanding, but one the level of engagement. Those who come for their own sake, and they come from all walks of life very often. What I've seen now, so I've done this, I've been doing this for one year, exactly one year now, a year and a month, I think. There are some that have taken every single course since, and they've, they've now started to... They, they had their own projects, but they weren't able maybe to fully articulate or needed someone else. So they needed a community. Um, and then it, so they need someone else to talk to. There are people who have formed reading groups out of these courses. They meet every week. And one, some of them have been meeting since June to read Heidegger's Being in Time. They're still going every Sunday. Um, and it's, so it is, there is, you know, the usual, what is it that a professor does? It provides some sort of a space for a community of students, etc. The professor professes also to something, so something, namely something that's also lost in academia, trying to articulate truth without, of course, claiming to possess truth or be in power of it or anything, but trying to at least to articulate something that's true. And so I've seen people that have come out of these courses who become more coherent in their thoughts, who can more coherently just converse, but also, and these are, you know, these are uh, not even, some of them will be actually now, will start teaching courses for Halkion, 
Oh, nice. Because I think they're so, you know, so good that they should t start teaching. Um, and also, just one of them has a project on the ontology of, of information, for example, something I support. I recorded a dialogue with him last week. It's on my channel uh, with Lou. He's, he's got very good, he studied philosophy, he's, he knows ancient Greek, um, but I think the courses, so he, did, he didn't need the course to understand anything about Heidegger, but I think what someone like him does need is other people mm -hmm. or a bit of guidance. And yeah, but, but just to come back to your point on the traditional institutions, I'm not one to run around and say, it, 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 you know, it should all burn down. We don't need universities. I think that's wrong. I think we, we need universities and need to be improved again. Um, and I'm, you could say, a product myself of a very classical education. I went to a humanistic gymnasium, which means um, I, I had Latin and ancient Greek. I majored in ancient Greek. I then went on to study in Italy and the US, an interdisciplinary program, economics, philosophy, and politics. And I went to King's and did my PhD at Warwick. And without four years of listening to Stephen Holgate on Hegel or Miguel de Bestegui on Deleuze and, mm -hmm. and Heidegger or Keith Ansel Pearson on Nietzsche, I wouldn't be able to and i learned how to teach also from from them right kind of the, the the charisma perhaps also but you have to be able to get across how do you mention something that you listen to a podcast between murphy uh and me on heidegger uh i i think i i took in a lot from from stephen holgate mm -hmm. who is able to read the signs of logic by hegel in german and english and then be able is able to translate it from the German into the English so that it makes sense to an English audience also. So I wouldn't be sitting here without um, without this formation, this education. Mm -hmm. So I think it's absolutely necessary that we that this is somehow kept alive. But we also by perhaps also, and this is maybe just pure fantasy, but perhaps by by creating these escape routes, right? The the, the institutions will begin to see. That there's something else that's possible that students actually want so it could be reinforcing in a good way that's interesting yeah i think you could be right about that you mentioned well it's in the name of the title the, the halkion thinkers guild and i think just even invoking that language is important right now i think you and several other people uh, i've spoken with have commented that there's something about um, sort of medieval institutional structures, or maybe that's too, putting it too strongly. There's something about those kind of metaphors uh, that we yeah. want something like a guild. We want something like a kind of an apprenticeship model. Um, yeah. We understand that, you know, close, close engagement with, you know, a learned teacher is important that relationship has taken different forms throughout history, just in terms of, you know, maybe kind of more of a spiritual director in one's life, or even just, you know, old Greek notions. I think, you know, the academy and the lyceum seem structurally more similar to what you're doing than um, a modern university, you know, in ways. It's, it's a, yeah. more of a kind of a a participatory thing um, with with students sort of choosing to go there, not for not for degrees and credentials, but to transform themselves, to transform their lives, and that's that's what I think is really interesting, and in that we we may be able to recover here. Can you say a little bit more, just concretely, for people who who don't know anything about Halkion, like what what could they expect? Like how do they sign up? How do they join? Do they sign up for courses with you? Is there uh, how does it work? Because there's a publication aspect, I believe. Um, how yeah. can they, like, so what sort of levels of participation are possible and, and how could they get, get involved? Yeah, thanks uh, for offering me that, that chance to just maybe briefly touch on this. So as it, as it is these days, <laughs> you set up a website and then see what happens. Um, I brought in people like uh, Guy Sangstock, and just some of my friends um, that I had been 
either organizing conferences with or having chats anyways. So we started recording some, what I now some refer to as Halkion Symposioi, Halkion Symposions, where we discussed some topics. That was basically the beginning of it. And then after the, the first course on Deleuze and Heidegger, I thought I'd just try my luck during the first lockdown last year and offered the Idleness with Dignity course. And then um, someone off that course said, well, you know, it would be nice to, to stay in touch with people. Is there any chance we could do this? I, actually, I could use, I could maybe just integrate a forum on my website. So I had to build a forum. Uh, it's a very rudimentary forum, but I think it works quite well. And then I experimented a bit throughout the year of what to do with it. I, I published some of my essays. I published because I was actually really impressed with the student talks of some of the courses. I published uh, the proceedings of the talks um, and will probably continue to do so, not for every single course, but for the bigger courses and maybe then selected um, essays that really am, are impressive. And so, you know, you, you could kind of start, I thought about starting as a sort of a online community that people pay for it to be in, but that very quickly turns you into an online community organizer. Mm -hmm. And I have never used forums. I have come back. <laughs> I'm probably the same age, but I'm 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 not so I didn't grow up on the internet, I guess. So I, I that's not something for me. I am active on the forum and if people ask me something, but it's mostly there what what Halkin offers currently is when I find someone interesting, I will reach out to them and try and get them in to one of the so students that I notice that who are, you know who've got something to say, I'll invite them on to have a conversation with me philosophically on a certain topic. I'll try and be as supportive as I can with, um, with, with where their talents are. And, and the, the nice thing is though that it, I think it generates some sort of a spirit of a guilt because it's once you've, you've signed up for one of the courses, you're in the forum, you do whatever you want with it, right? Uh, if you want to start a reading group and so other people will go with it, go ahead, use the forum for that. And people do it. They read Nishitani together and Heidegger and Henry Goban, whoever else they're reading. So that's the route in. And what's really been nice, so Stee, uh, is another Stee Doherty, um, really nice chap from, from the south of England, um, been on every single course since the Idleness course. He offered to, and that's in the spirit of the guild, right? He offered to... Uh, typeset and design the proceedings of the student essays. I would be completely incapable of doing that. Um, it would take me years. So I'm really grateful that he offered this. And this is, this is what I'd like to cultivate. It's this kind of, a, so the route in is, is through the courses. That's the easiest way. Um, and, and then, you know, make yourself useful uh, and make the best of, of this kind of a, of a forum to if you want to read a book read a book people ask questions and they, they do sometimes have conversations on i'm very interested in economics so i recently started a new uh, branch and trying to get a bit of a pooling of uh, questions um from economic history and monetary policy etc so it is that's the route in it's through the courses and as i said before a couple of them will start teaching themselves now and it's but it's it's it needs to grow slowly mm. that's very important that there's nothing I'm, I'm not trying to build a, a scalable business that i can sell uh within two years or so uh, this is um, not to be sold this is to be to be growing but slowly and its own pace yeah you're a purist i hear it <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> so if people so basically you sign up for a course and that gives you you then you can join the forum or yeah. That's basically how it goes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. What would you say even considering that it should go 
grow slow and grow organically. What, what would you say is sort of the next step for you or what do you, what do you need to, ha- what do you need to happen in order to go to that next step? Mm. I suppose the next step is to then have more teachers. If all goes well, there will be two more within the next four or five months with a course on Hegel and a course on Nishitani. Um, What needs to happen for that is they need to send me the course material. (laughs) So that's been discussed. It's, It's now... The offer is there they've they've accepted so that's that's all that needs to happen for that um and then i guess overall it you know but this is this is where this is where it gets interesting maybe also in terms of heidegger uh, for heidegger any kind of institution is inauthentic Das man right the, the much bemoaned das man the they self and the public etc so anything that becomes too institutionalized or too much of um, too rigid can easily fall prey to the same kind of mechanisms or yeah that other institutions also fail from. So I think the the art will be to mediate or juggle with with some way of establishing a more or less founded foundational curriculum, but at the same time, be let, let it be open enough so that it doesn't become some sort of a rigid uh, enterprise that you know, offers some sort of a course every single year. And then, uh, yeah, kind of the, the, the spirit is gone. It needs to be able to carry on its own fire somehow. So this is this is one of the reasons why I, I don't think that academia currently would be good for me because I don't see any fire. I don't see I don't I see some people who have Ivo de Cinado is one of them, right? Who who really who are thinkers, not scholars, uh, who want to think. And there's a difference between being a scholar and going through every single footnote of someone and finding a mistake here or what someone else has said, etc. And someone who's trying to think and understand and diagnose our time and as long as that fire is not out that fire won't go out with Halkin either I think but that's so that's perhaps then what needs to be kept alive yeah there's a real tension there I think for for any organization whether it be kind of you know more of like a a school or like with the side view it's a conversation I have with myself all the time too about having enough of a kind of a you need some kind of a coherent, like a theme or like a, a s- sort of set of symbolic references that kind of makes it a unity that makes it something distinct without then that thing um, becoming its own system of capture, you know, where you yes. kind of, you kind of stop, you kind of stop the project of thinking and just try and fit everything into, you, you know, you see this, like you have to create some kind of a brand identity which then immediately starts to kind of cannibalize the, yeah. the inspiration for the idea. And then you're kind yeah. of, you're kind of stuck fending off the impression that you've given people so that you can continue to, to think in a, in a live way. I find that you need um, practices um, in Pierre Hadot's sense of spiritual yeah. exercises uh, philosophical practices. Um, those are the ways that I try to keep myself a, a, awake or um, that I, that I remember, you know, in the kind of platonic sense that yeah. uh, I can't just go on autopilot. I can't just, I can't just let uh, one set of concepts kind of become an unthinking part of given yeah. or reality or whatever. Yeah. Um, what what sort of practices if even if, if you even think about it explicitly in that way what kind of practices yeah. are a, sort of a part of your life that um cuz i have that sense i think i think if i'm good at anything it's it's spotting people who are 
kind of awake and doing something interesting. And I have that sense with you. It's if you know what to look for, you can you can see it pretty quickly. Uh, but then it's a question of like, how does that how does that come about for you? How do you, how do you kind of maintain that in your own life? Um, and I know, I know for some people they have like formal answers where they're part of a, they're part of a spiritual or contemplative tradition and they have formal training and stuff like that. But I don't think that's necessary, um, necessarily. Yeah. So I'm asking, I'm asking that question in the sort of widest possible sense. How, yeah. how do you keep your thinking alive? Well, first of all, and this comes back to a, an earlier question where you said something we had. Uh, so I said, I'm not ever going to produce content. I'm, so I'm never going with the times, right? I don't go on Google and say, oh, there, there's an uptick in interest in Parmenides. I should like to uh, put, up a, put out a course. No, I simply, um, it came out of actually, I always mentioned the Greek. So someone said during the Heidegger or Nietzsche course or whatever, uh, could you ever teach a course on the Greeks? And to teach a course on the Greeks, so that would take years, but you can take three or four of these, at least early thinkers, because the fragments are short enough to get people some sort of an idea. So it was born um, out of this, but also out of my own attempts to learn Greek again and to read these texts again, because I, I need it for my, for my own philosophical project. At the moment, I'm trying to write um, an original work actually on memory or recollection and, and thinking. And what are the, the practices? I don't think that there are, so I, I don't meditate or anything, maybe I should, but uh, I don't have any, so I, don't, I don't know if it's a practice, but as you know, there is no philosophy without scolè. And then we have to, add, usually that's translated as leisure, Another word could be perhaps idleness that has very negative connotations in, in the English vernacular because it's sometimes conflated with laziness. But scolè, thought by itself, comes from echein in the ancient Greek, which means to have and hold. So scolè is not just leisure or musa in German, but is finding a stance in the midst of beings so that one has a measure or knows a measure of sufficiency. And perhaps, and this is not always easy to have a measure of sufficiency in, in anything you do or uh, attempt, but it, at least sometimes I, I aspire to it, to, to also, and also to, to when, to remind myself when perhaps it sometimes because it, everything can get busy and stressful, uh, anything that we do, right? Um, even having the, the best philosophical dialogues can become just, if, it's, if it becomes sort of a, a question of having to produce at some point, you have to remind yourself that you're not producing. You're, uh, th there's a, it, it's coming from the place of scolaire. And if it comes from that place, then it's not, about having to produce or following some sort of a will to optimization, but it's following another, another, um, there's a different uh, Anspruch, there's a different claim to it. So that to me is, is one of the ways perhaps, which would mean some sort of a, a practice, but of course then the other practices are quite standard. They are to read every day, to read widely, mostly primary sources. Um, reading currently Aristotle's Metaphysics, Hegel's lectures on the history of philosophy, John Burnett's early Greek philosophy, and some of the early Greek thinkers themselves, and writing. So, and, and writing is a very important practice, and that means to write also by hand, but also to uh, uh, on the computer, of course. And I make music. Mm. That helps. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you have this whole other side. That yeah. Yeah, uh, that's someone else. That's you got to talk to him over here. He's yeah, you actually one. yeah you had to create a different person to. That's that was that took me years to just say, and it it was almost a joke when I first did it. 
Yeah. It was a joke on Twitter when I said, you know, I wanted to make make people aware, my five followers on Twitter at the time, that <laughs> well, I make well, music. Tell, tell people, yeah, tell people the, the background here of, of what you're doing. Should, so this guy, as the Americans would say, this other guy, John Wolvar is his name. Wolvar means will. So this is, this is an artist name from the, t- the time when I was very Nietzschean. Uh, John is English for Johannes. And Boulevard mm-hmm. means will. Mm-hmm. So um, that comes from about 10 years ago, I think from the time when I lived in Seattle. So I've always ma- I started making music when I was 16 or 17. Bought myself a cheap guitar and started writing horrible songs. And I still write horrible songs to this day. And I record sometimes. So um, I've got a couple of uh, LPs. One of them, two of them recorded in, in London. And then an actual studio, um, and but it was always you know, how do, how do you bring this together? So I just started to referring to Tron Wilva as my alter ego, and uh, that kind of separation allows for a bit of a, a play, playful character. Mm-hmm. Who's but there are I think there are philosophical lyrics in in that mm-hmm. in that music sometimes. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me, um, even if you don't create like an explicit alter ego um i think that's one of the others the other weird yeah. consequences of of being online and having like a twitter uh following and you know yes. people who people who come to your page or follow your work they follow it for a reason you know i have all kinds of interests in my life outside of what's what's happening with the side view or whatever but that's not why yeah. people follow me you know so exactly, yeah. i'll i'll spare you the details of you know my my random idiosyncrasies but it was funny to see to see that um that show up um i know you have to go uh teach your course pretty soon here so why don't we just wrap up with you know some basic information where can where can people find you where can they find halkion um how do they you know, get in touch with you and get involved. I'm on YouTube. That's where you can find lectures and uh, philosophical dialogues. The handle for that is classical philosophy. I'm on Twitter as Johannes Achille. My parents chose to give me a lot of Greek uh, first names. I chose two of them for my publication, so you'll find me on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Best way to contact me is probably either through Twitter or the email address, which is on uh, the YouTube channel also. Wonderful. Well, thanks for sharing your work with us and for giving us some of your time. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with, with Halkion and with your work in general. And Maybe we can do this again and do a little check-in in in six months or a year and and see how things have progressed. Yes, would love to. Yeah, thank you so much, Adam. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. 